Hello everyone and welcome to Control Engineering and Control Theory Tutorials. In these tutorials we present real and applicable knowledge of control engineering, control theory, machine learning, optimization, signal processing, etc. In this video tutorial we explain how to derive a model predicted control algorithm from scratch. Moreover, we explain how to implement the model predicted control algorithm in Python. Since this is the first tutorial in a series of tutorials on model predictive control, in this video tutorial we will consider linear systems and we will not consider state and input constraints. However, as you will see later on in this video tutorial, you can implicitly constrain the inputs and states by properly choosing the weighting matrices. Also, since this is the first tutorial part, we assume that the state of the system is perfectly known. In future tutorials, we will develop model predictive control algorithms when the state is not known. That is, we will integrate an observer with the model predictive control algorithms. Also, in future tutorials, we will consider the constraint and nonlinear model predictive control problems and formulations. The GitHub page with the developed codes is given in the description below this video. Finally, before I start with the explanations, I would like to mention the following. It took me a significant amount of time, energy and planning to create this completely free video tutorial as well as more than 300 free video tutorials that you can find on my YouTube channel. And consequently, I kindly ask you to press the like and subscribe buttons. Thanks a lot. Okay, let's start. We consider the linear system given by the equation number one. Over here, xk is the state, uk is the control input, zk is the output that we want to control, and a, b, and c are the system matrices. k is a discrete time index. That is, we consider the problem formulation in discrete time. In the current problem formulation, the output zk is not necessarily the observed output. That is, it's not necessarily equal to the measured output. In our problem formulation, zk is actually a set of state variables that should follow a desired reference trajectory. Since this is the first part of the tutorial series of model predictive control, we will assume that the state vector xk is perfectly known. That is, we assume that we have perfectly reconstructed the state vector. In our future tutorials, we will consider the case when the state vector is not directly observable. In that case, we will couple a state reconstructor that is also known as an observer with the model predictive control algorithm. Next, we introduce a new notation which is illustrated in this figure. First of all, we need to define a prediction horizon. The length of the prediction horizon is denoted by f. The prediction horizon is the future prediction horizon over which we will predict the state and output trajectories and over which we will control the system. The prediction horizon length, denoted by f, is selected by the user and in some cases can also be seen as a tuning parameter. Next, we need to define the control horizon. The length of the control horizon is denoted by v. The control horizon is the future control horizon over which we allow for the control inputs to change. That is, we assume that the control inputs can be changed starting from the current time until the end of the control horizon. That is, from here to here. After the control horizon is completed, we assume that control inputs stay constant and they are equal to this value. That is, to the last value in the control horizon. The control horizon is selected by the user and in some cases it can be a tuning parameter. The goal of the model predictive controller is to determine a set of control inputs that are illustrated over here at the time instant k, that is at the current time, that will make the output or the state of the system to follow a prescribed output trajectory or the desired trajectory. For example, I want this trajectory to follow a certain desired trajectory. And I want to determine control inputs shown over here, 
such that this is achieved in practice. Next, we need to explain this notation. Input u with the subscript k plus i vertical bar k is the control input at the time step k plus i and that is computed at the time step k. This control input, or better to say a series of control inputs for different i's, is obtained as the solution of the model predictive control problem. Here, it's very important to keep in mind that the control input vector only varies until k plus v, that is, it only varies inside of the control horizon. After that, it is constant and equal to u k plus v minus 1. Let's explain this. The inputs after the control horizon, that is, the inputs u k plus v k, then input u k plus v plus 1 k, until u k plus f k are constant, and they are equal to the last control input in the control horizon. That is, they are equal to u k plus v minus 1 computed at k. In the same manner, we define this notation and this notation. For example, when you see something like this, x with the subscript k plus i, vertical bar k, this is the prediction of the state vector at the time instant k plus i, and that's made at the time instant k. Similarly, when you see something like this, z k plus i, K, this is the prediction of the output vector at the time instant k plus i and that is made at the time instant k. The goal of the model predictive controller is to determine a set of control inputs inside of the control horizon at the time step k that will make the output trajectory of the system that is z k plus i to follow a prescribed output trajectory or desired control trajectory over the prediction horizon. This is done by using the knowledge of the current state and the system model matrices A, B, and C. The model is used to predict the output trajectory over the prediction horizon and then to minimize the difference between the desired and predicted trajectories. This will become more clear in the future. Next, we will derive the model predictive control algorithm. Let us assume that we are currently at the time instant k and that we want to make state and output predictions up to the time instant k plus f. Also, let us assume that the state at the time instant k is perfectly known. That is, we assume that xk is perfectly known. From our state space model, we obtain these two equations. Note what happens over here. We simply substitute it in our state space model that looks like this. Input uk by this input that we want to compute and xk plus 1 by this prediction that we actually want to compute. Similarly, the output equation looks like this. And in this output equation, we simply substituted xk plus 1 by this prediction and zk plus 1 by this prediction. And that's it. Now, by combining this equation and this equation, we obtain this equation. Then, by using this equation and the state space model and by propagating time to the time instant k plus 2, we can obtain this equation. We simply do back substitution over here, we substitute xk plus 1 bar k by this term and we obtain this equation. And by combining this equation with the output equation, we obtain this equation. By using the same principle for the time instant k plus 3, we obtain the equations given in this equation number 4. This equation can be written in the compact form, given by the equation number 5. 
Here, we should keep in mind that our goal is to compute these vectors. By continuing with this procedure until the time index v, and keep in mind that v is the control horizon, we obtain this equation. Nothing special. We simply start it from here, we go time step k plus 2, k plus 3, until k plus v to obtain this equation. Now, this index v is very important mainly because after this index we introduce this constraint on the control inputs. That is, we assume that the control inputs outside of the control horizon are equal. And they are actually equal to this vector over here. That is, they are equal to the control input that is the last vector in the control horizon. By using this constraint and by propagating the time index from k plus v to k plus v plus 1, we obtain this equation. And over here, let us stop for a second. And let us analyze this equation and this equation. The difference is in this term over here. And this term is a direct consequence of this constraint. If we continue further until the end of the prediction horizon, we will obtain the last equation. And the last equation will look like this. And you can see this term, that's the direct consequence of this constraint. This equation can be written compactly, like this. Notice what I did. I simply took this term and I simply said, okay, now to ease my notation, I will denote this term like this, where the term is given like this. Or in the general case, we can introduce this sum of the matrix A to simplify all the expressions. Now, by combining all of these prediction equations, we finally obtain our lifted predict prediction equation. It looks like this. This equation is very, very, very important since it enables us to predict the outputs of the systems on the basis of the current state and on the basis of the future control inputs. We can write this equation in a more compact form given by the equation number 14. The matrix O is defined over here, the matrix M is defined over here, the vector U is defined over here, and the vector Z is defined over here. The model predictive control problem can be formulated as follows. The goal is to track a reference or desired output trajectory. Let these desired outputs be denoted like this. Z k plus 1 with a superscript D is the desired output of the system at the time instant k plus 1. And in the same manner, we define the other desired outputs. Again, to stress, when you see the superscript D, this means the outputs are actually desired outputs. Next, we can group these desired outputs in this vector, Z, with the superscript D. Now, a natural way of formulating the model predictive control problem is to determine the vector of control inputs U such that the following cost function is minimized. Over here, I want to find the vector of control inputs over the control horizon such that the difference between the desired and the actual system trajectory is minimized. That is, I'm minimizing the tracking error. And this problem can be mathematically formulated like this. However, there is one big issue with this approach. The issue with this approach is that we do not have control on the magnitude of control inputs U. The control inputs can be extremely large and thus impossible to be applied in practice. Or they can lead to actuator saturation that can lead to devastating effects in the feedback control loop. Consequently, we need to introduce a penalty on the control inputs in the cost function. Furthermore, we need to introduce weights in the control cost function to have better control on the convergence of the algorithm. Here, we introduce a new cost function that penalizes the inputs and this function has this form. So what's happening over here? 
This is the current input at the time instant k. This is the input at the time instant k plus 1. This term penalizes the magnitude of the current input. And as you will see later on, once we solve the problem, we will only apply this input and we will disregard all other inputs in this state, in this control input vector. And that's why it's very important to penalize the magnitude of the first input. Then, what's happening over here? We are actually, actually penalizing the difference between UK plus 1 and UK. That is, we don't allow UK plus 1 to deviate too much from UK. And we do that by introducing this weight. And in the same manner, and by using these finite differences, we penalize the differences between two subsequent control inputs. Now, let us write this cost function in a matrix form. To do that, first we need to observe the following. If I take my vector u and if I multiply it with this matrix, I will obtain this vector over here. And you can see over here that this entry of this vector appears here. Then this entry of this vector appears here, this entry appears here, and finally this entry appears here. This is very important observation. We can write this expression like this, where this matrix W1 is defined like this. And then it can easily be shown that this cost function can actually be written like this. So let's analyze what's happening over here. This part is actually this part over here only transposed. So when you see, for example, this, this is exactly the column vector. And when you see thing like this, then this is this vector transposed. And over here, I need to introduce another weighting function, or better to say weighting matrix, that takes into account these Q matrices. And that's precisely this weighting matrix W2. And consequently, the function can be written like this. And after a few matrix transformations, we can actually write it like this, where this W3 weighting function is defined like this. The cost function ju penalizes the control effort and the difference between two control inputs. However, we need another cost function. We need a cost function that will penalize the tracking error. And here's that cost function. This cost function penalizes, or better to say, takes into account the difference between the desired outputs and predicted outputs. And we take all the outputs starting from k plus 1 until k plus f. That is, we take all the outputs over the prediction horizon. Over here, p1, p2, until pf are the weighting matrices that are selected by the user. Next, we can introduce this matrix, and by using this matrix, we can write this cost function like this. If we now substitute our expression for z that's given by the equation 14, that is given by this equation, in the cost function, we will obtain this part over here. And if we simply call zd minus oxk as s, we can write this cost function like this. Again, this part of the cost function penalizes the difference between the desired trajectory and the control trajectory. Next, we define the total cost function and the minimization problem given over here. The total cost function penalizes the control effort and the difference between the control inputs as well as the tracking error. And we determine the control input u vector such that this cost function is minimized. By substituting the expressions for ju and jz in this cost function, we obtain this form. Next, we need to minimize this cost function. To do this, let us expand these matrix and vector terms. By performing simple matrix vector multiplication, we can write the total cost function j like this. Next, we need to minimize the scalar function over here. That is, we need to compute partial derivative of j with respect to our vector u. 
We can do that by recalling formulas for the derivative of scalar functions with respect to vectors. Let w be a vector and a be a constant vector. Then let h be a constant symmetric matrix. Then by using this amazing book and by looking into chapter 2.4, we can find the expressions of partial derivatives of scalar functions with respect to vectors. And by using the formulas from this book, we will be able to solve this problem. Here are the two formulas we need. And we will simply use these formulas to compute the partial derivatives. We need to compute 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 partial derivatives. Let's start with this term. The partial derivative of this scalar term with respect to vector u is 0. This is because this term doesn't depend on u. Then, we can use this formula to compute the partial derivative of this second term. To remind you, here is the second term. And as the result, we obtain this expression. Similarly, the partial derivative of the third term is given over here. Here is the third term. Here is the fourth term. Its partial derivative is given over here, and to compute this partial derivative, you, we use this formula. And finally, we need to compute the partial derivative of the last term, that is the term over here, and here it is. To compute this partial derivative, we use this formula. By using these five expressions, we can compute the partial derivative of the cost function j with respect to u, and here is the expression. To find the minimum of the cost function, we need to solve this equation for u. By substituting this term in this equation, we obtain this equation, this equation, and finally we obtain this equation. From the last equation, we obtain the solution of the model predictive control problem, and the solution is given by the equation 42. We simply invert this matrix. It can be shown that this is the solution that actually minimizes the cost function j. This can be shown by computing a Hessian matrix and by showing that the Hessian matrix is positive definite. The solution u can be expressed like this. We only need the first entry, that is, we only need u hat k k, and we apply this input to the system. After we apply the simple to the system, we wait for the system to respond. That is, we wait until the next time instant, k plus 1. We observe the system state at the time instant, k plus 1, and we form another cost function for the time instant, k plus 1. Then, we again compute the solution. However, this time, starting from k plus 1, k plus 1, we apply the solution to the system and repeat the complete procedure for the time step k plus 2. Here is the summary of the model predictive control algorithm. At the time instant k, on the basis of the known state vector xk and by using the matrices a, b, and c, we form the lifted system matrices and we compute our solution. Then, at the step number 2, we extract this term over here, we apply it to the system. We wait for the system to respond and we obtain the state measurement xk plus 1. Then we shift the index to k plus 1 and we go to step 1. In step 1 now, k is equal to k plus 1 and we repeat the complete procedure recursively. What is very important to keep in mind here? Although we compute the complete set of inputs over the control horizon, we only apply the first thing. So keep in mind that. In the sequel, we explain how to implement the model predictive control algorithm in Python. All the code files presented in this video tutorial are available on my GitHub page. A link to my GitHub page is given in the description below this video tutorial. To implement the controller in Python, we will be using the object-oriented approach and consequently here is the Python class that implements the model predictive controller. Here is the init function. The input arguments are 
A, B, and C, these are the system matrices, F is the prediction horizon, V is the control horizon, W3 is the input weight matrix, W4 is the prediction weight matrix, X0 is the initial state of the system, and desired control trajectory total is our desired or reference trajectory. Over here we initialize the variables. Then we extract the dimensions of the matrices. This variable current time step plays the role of our k, that is, this variable tracks the progress of the model predicted control algorithm. Every time we compute the control input, we increment this variable. This list over here is used to store the states and consequently we append this list with x0. This list is used to store the computed control inputs. This list is used to store the outputs of our system. In our init function we call this function form lifted matrices. This function will actually form the matrix O, matrix M, and the gain matrix of our controller. Here are the O and M matrices. To remind you, these are the matrices of our prediction equation. On the other hand, the gain matrix is the matrix that is used to compute the controller. And here it is. The gain matrix is this matrix over here. We can actually pre-compute this matrix. This is because M doesn't depend on the time index, W doesn't depend on the time index, and W3 doesn't depend on the time index. So the gain matrix can be computed. Again, the gain matrix is this matrix over here. The init function is called first time an object of a class is constructed. This function will store the system matrices as well as some other parameters necessary to implement the model predictive controller. Also, this function will form the matrices O, M, and the gain matrix. These matrices are formed by using the function form lifted matrix. Let us briefly explain the function form lifted matrices. First, we need to form the matrix O, and here is how we do that. Here is the matrix O. The matrix O is formed row-wise, that is, we form every block in a for loop. And you can see it over here. The code is relatively simple. We recursively compute the powers of A necessary to form these blocks. Next, we form the matrix M. While forming the matrix M, we need to consider two cases. First, we need to form these blocks up to v minus 1, that is, up to this index. This is because the pattern of forming this matrix changes from here to here, and consequently, we need to consider two cases. And here are the cases. We have the first case if the index of the row is smaller than V, and keep in mind that V is actually the control horizon, that is, this index over here, that is, all these rows from here to here correspond to the control horizon, that is, they are inside of the control horizon, while this part from here to here is outside the control horizon, however, inside of the prediction horizon and you can see it over here. Over here we form the second part of the matrix, that is the part from here to here, and you can also see that we recursively compute the powers of A necessary to form these blocks over here. Over here we define the function that's used to propagate our dynamics. This function simply takes the current state and the current input and it computes the next state and the current output. That is, this function simply implements this equation. Plus b times uk and yk is 
cxk. This part is actually formed over here. That is, here is xk plus 1. That is this term. And here is yk. The function accepts two inputs. The first input is the uk, and the second input is state that corresponds to xk. Finally, the function returns xk plus 1, and it returns yk. And finally, here is the main function of our class. Over here, we compute the control inputs and we apply them. Here's our desired control trajectory. And over here, we have to stop and explain the following. The total desired trajectory, that is this variable, is the complete trajectory. Our trajectory looks like this. When we initialize the model predictive controller, we initialize it the desired trajectory. For example, we want our system output to behave like this, where this is time and this is output. However, how do we control the system? We actually start from zero. We, that is, we start from here. And then, our desired control trajectory is actually a segment of this trajectory starting, for example, from here until here, where this interval is our f. That is, this is our prediction horizon. Then, we compute the control input. That is, we compute u0,0. Then we apply this input to the system, and then what do we do next? we proceed to the time instant k is equal to 1, and again, we take the segment of this trajectory corresponding to k is equal to 1, and we take f points in the future, and again, this segment over here now, let me use a different color, that is over this segment from here to here, you cannot see black on this screen, obviously, so I need to use yellow. Okay, this segment over here is now our desired control trajectory for k is equal to 1. And we do it recursively. That is, we always take a segment of our total trajectory and we fill in this vector, desired control trajectory, and we compute the control inputs. We do that recursively. After we define the desired control trajectory, we need to define the vector s. And going back to our tutorial, here's how we define the vector s. zd is our desired trajectory, o is the lifted matrix, and xk is the current state. You can see it over here. Next, we compute the control sequence. We simply multiply the gain matrix with the vector s. That is, we implement this equation, where again, the gain matrix is this part over here. And here is the implementation. Then, we extract the first input from our control input trajectory, that is, we use this vector, then we apply this vector to our system by calling the propagate dynamics function. This function will propagate axk plus buk, that is, it will compute xk plus 1, it will return xk plus 1, and it will return yk. And then we store xk plus 1, we store yk, we store the applied input, and then we increment the time index k for 1. And that's it. That's our class. Simple as that. Not too complex. To test the model predictive control algorithm, we need a test case. And here's our test case. It's a system consisting of two masses that are connected by springs and dampers. We assume that the following parameters are given. Masses M1 and M2 spring constants k1 and k2 
and damping constants d1 and d2. Next, we need to construct a state space model of this system. To make this video tutorial as short as possible, I created a separate video tutorial that explains how to construct the state space model. And here is the second tutorial. This tutorial is actually dedicated to a system identification algorithm. And you can safely skip the explanation of the system identification algorithm and you can read this section. In this section, I explain how to form the state space model. You can find this web page tutorial by clicking over here. Here's the state space model. The states are the position of mass m1, and that variable is denoted by x1. The velocity of m1 is denoted by x2. The position of m2 is denoted by x3, and the velocity of m2 is denoted by x4. F is the control force that we apply to our system, and here you can see AC, BC, and C system matrices. Over here, we assume that only the position of the first mass is actually being measured. And consequently, our C matrix looks like this. However, we cannot implement the model predictive control algorithm by directly using this model. We need to discretize it. To discretize the state space model, we use the backward Euler method. The backward Euler method approximates the first derivative of x by using finite differences. And here's the approximation. Here's how the right-hand side will look after the approximation. Here h is the discrete time constant. That is the discretization constant. Next, by manipulating this equation, we can finally obtain the discretized system given by the equation 47 where the system matrices are defined like this. And to remind you, AC and BC are actually the system matrices of the continuous time model. The C matrix and the output equation stays the same. Okay, now we are ready to test the model predictive control algorithm. And here is a driver code file that I've wrote and that explains how to use the class and how to numerically test the model predictive control algorithm. First, we need to import the necessary libraries. We need the NumPy and we need the plotting tools. Next, from this file called function mpc, we need to import this function, system simulate. This function is used to visualize a step response of our system. And here it is. It's given in this file. The function is very simple. It will simply simulate the classical state space equation, that is, it will simulate xk plus 1 is equal to axk plus buk and yk is cxk. For a given uk and for a given x0, that is, given x0 and the sequence of the control inputs, this function will generate in the recursive manner x1, x2 up to xn plus 1 by simply propagate, propagating this equation. Also, this function will generate y1, y2, y3 up to yn. And the function will return the matrices y and x. These matrices are used to store these vectors. And that's it. After importing the function system simulate, we need to import our class model predictive control from the file model predictive control. Next, we need to define the model predictive control algorithm parameters. These parameters are the prediction horizon and the control horizon. Over here, I assume that the prediction and control horizon are the same. However, for illustration, I will change. For example, I'll put for, for example 18 over here. Next, we need to define the model. That is, we need to define the continuous time model. M1, M2, K1, K2, D1, and D2 parameters. Here they are. Here how, here's how they enter the continuous time model. And 
we need to form AC, BC, and CC matrices. AC, BC, and CC matrices. Then we define the number of inputs of outputs and the state dimension. And over here we discretize and simulate the system step response. We compute the system matrices A, B, and C that are necessary for implementing the model predictive controller and we simulate the step response of the system. Let's do that and let's see the result. Over here I'll erase this part and I will clear my window so we can easily see the results. To simulate the system I will assume that the input is equal to 10. That is, this force over here is equal to 10 newtons. And let's see the result. Voila, here it is. Here is the system response. We can see that the system is not damped enough. The next step is to form the weighting matrices. First, we need to form the matrix W1. Here is the matrix W1. To remind you, this matrix is used to define this vector over here that is necessary to define our cost function. Next, we need to define the matrix W2. Here it is. To create the matrix W2, we need to assume certain values for these sub-weighting matrices Q0 and other values of Q for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here they are, Q0, Q1, Q2, up to QV-1. Q0 is used to penalize the magnitude of the first control input. To remind you, the first control input is the most important one since we directly apply it to the system. And here's how I selected the weight. And the other values, that is, all other matrices, Q1, Q2, Q3, up to QV, minus 1, in my case, they're denoted by Q other, and they're equal to this number. Over here, I formed a W2 matrix. It's a simple block diagonal matrix given over here. And finally, I need to form W3 matrix. W3 matrix is formed by using W1 and W2. I simply implement this formula over here. And next, I need to define W4 matrix. The W4 matrix is used to form this cost function. That is, the cost function that penalizes the tracking performance. And again, it's a block diagonal matrix with these blocks. I assume that all these blocks are equal to 10. I found these values of weighting matrices by trial and error and after some tuning. However, you can change these parameters and you can investigate by yourself how do these parameters influence the performance of the model predictive controller. That's a homework for you. Next, we need to define the reference trajectory or better to say reference trajectories. And here you have a complete freedom. I tested the model predictive control algorithm by using three reference trajectories. The first reference trajectory is the exponential trajectory defined over here. Then I tested the method by using a pulse trajectory. And finally, I tested the method by using the step trajectory. Over here, in order to make this video tutorial as short as possible, I will present the results for the pulse trajectory. Let's evaluate everything from here until the beginning and let us test the model predictive control algorithm. First, we need to define the initial state. Then, we need to create the model predictive control object. Over here, we are actually calling the init function. We specify the system matrices, the values of control and the prediction horizon, the weighting matrices x0 and desired trajectory. Over here, we simulate the controller. We have a simple for loop. In this for loop, we call this function compute control inputs. This function, as explained previously, will compute the control inputs, it will apply them to the system, and it will store the output states and the inputs in the corresponding lists. Let's run the MPC controller.
Okay, nothing happens. No plots. To generate the plots, we need to extract the information, that is the corresponding vectors, from our MPC object. And we do it over here. And finally, we are ready to plot. First, we will plot the values of the outputs. Let's see the outputs. Here they are. The desired trajectory is a pulse. It's represented by a red line, and the response of the system is represented by the blue line. We can see that the model predictive controller is able to track relatively well the pulse trajectory. Of course, we see over here these peaks. These peaks can be eliminated actually by changing the values of the weighting matrices. For example, by decreasing these values, we can get a better response. To show you that, I will simply make these values to be relatively low, and then I will run everything up to here, and let's see the results. And you can see that we have perfect tracking. However, this is not the answer. And why this is not the answer? Well, because over here I will plot the inputs. And let's see the inputs that are applied to the system. Here they are. Do you see these huge magnitudes of the inputs at the points where we actually have to rapidly change the direction? You can see the values of 8,000, etc. This is unacceptable. The system will be in saturation. Consequently, you need to penalize the control inputs. Consequently, we will return these values to the original values, and let's see what happens with the inputs. Here they are. We can see that inputs are now relatively okay. They don't assume huge values. However, the price we need to pay are these peaks. Okay, that will be all for today. I hope that you like this video. If you like the videos I create, please press the like and subscribe buttons. Thanks a lot and have a nice day.